I'm sorry, we have a lady disrupting the service right here. <laughs> so, uh, hi, Kim. You got me. Uh, so, there's so much to thank God for. And in the midst of all that we've been dealing with for the past two years or more, in the midst of that, God has still shown up. And I was just thinking the other day how many times he's shown up for me and for all of us. And I'm so grateful for what God's doing in every single one of you and in us. And uh, thankful for what he's doing at Valley Christian Church. And so we have so many ministries that are going. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get some slides made. We're going to look at all the ministries, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what God's doing. But today, I've asked Curtis to come and share about one ministry in particular that's... Kurt, come on up here. What time do you get up every Friday morning? You mean there's a 4 a.m. in the morning? <laughs> Oh, my lands. And the reason you do that is? To get things set up for the crew to come in and do the coffee. That's right. Coffee and donuts. And sometimes, have you ever wondered, is this worth it? <laughs> right. Not only from that perspective, but also just from a financial perspective. But I want you to give a, uh, a testimony about what happened this last Friday. That is so true. There are times you think, is this really worth it? And then God sends a message saying, yeah, you're doing the right thing. Um, when I first joined the group out there uh, a little over a year ago, uh, in the morning, there would be a gentleman in a little white car would drive by, and he'd slow down a little bit, and he'd come right by our canopy out there and just glare at us, but he kept going on by. We didn't do anything. We'd smile when he went by. And this was almost every Friday for a long time. And then we, we didn't see him and everything. And a couple of weeks ago, this car pulls up and we walk out to him. He puts down his window and he goes, so you guys are the real deal, right? And I said, yeah, we're trying to be anyway. And he said, I said, would you like a cup of coffee? That would be wonderful. So Liz went and got him a cup of coffee. I was showing him donuts, and he picked the donut and all that. He says, well, this is really a blessing. This is awesome that you guys are doing this, and went on his way. So God just, you know, works wonderful things uh, for us out there. And that's, you, then you go, yeah, this is worth it. Amen. Amen. How awesome is that, that these guys get up so early every Friday morning and are out here, no matter what the weather, and just handing out donuts and coffee. And that is a real outreach. And people are beginning to have, for a while, begun to recognize, hey, this is, that's Valley Christian Church. They, they're just giving those out. They're not trying to do anything. Uh, we're, they're just trying to give. And what a great testimony that is for the Lord Jesus and for Valley Christian Church. So, let me just say this. Um, I got to figure out how to say this. That costs money. It costs money to do, to do this outreach. Uh, it costs around 5000 a year. Is that right? So, it costs $5,000 a year to do that. Also, we have ministry, outreach ministry to Liberia, Loving Liberia. And we've seen God do so much in that ministry with the uh, vacation Bible school held <clears throat> this past January. And uh, Teacher Jane teaching for that. And uh, I am so blessed and so thankful for the ministries. And there, uh, like I said, in a couple weeks, we're going to show slides of all the ministries that are happening through Valley Christian Church. Men's, women's youth, and it's important for us to recognize that. What I will say to you is that all costs money. It, it costs money to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm asking that all of us pray and ask God, what is it, God, you've asked me to give? What is it God has asked you to give, not only financially, but in commitment? What does God want you to do today? Amen? So, we're going to pray. Uh, 
And Jane, you're going to come. I know you and somebody else. <laughs> Father God, thank you. Lord, what a great testimony. A guy who glared for years comes in and says, whoa, what a blessing. He, he was sold on the fact that this is real. And Lord, let us, I just pray you release the finances for Valley Christian Church. I pray that we will give according to what you put in our hearts to give. And I thank you, Lord, in advance for supplying everything we need. We love you so much, Lord Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing from the bottom of our hearts. We give freely because we've been freely given to in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, wait, Lisa, stop, stop, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jane, would you come up here, please? Uh, I have a riddle for you. A riddle? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. What has three pieces, each piece has the same primary function. Okay. They function very well on their own, but they function even better when they're together. I don't know. What... what? What has three pieces that function well apart but better together? I don't know either. I just needed to get you up here so we could do opportunities and tell the people what's coming up this weekend. Okay. I can do that. So, <laughs> opportunities. It always starts with, hello and welcome to Valley Christian Church. We're so glad you could be with us here today. Yeah, but we don't today. need to do that right now. Oh, they're, they're already here. So, go oh, ahead. Okay. 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 I see how it's going to be, guys. Okay. Our opportunity this week is coming this Saturday. We're having a Valentine's Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Now, I need to tell you right off the bat that when we say Valentine's Fellowship, we're not talking couples necessarily. We are talking adults, however, but please just come and fellowship with us. There's going to be um, desserts and snacks. It starts at 6.30 on this Saturday. Um, and I hear there'll be some live music playing, which mm -hmm. would be sort of cool. Ambiance will be playing. Um, when I talk about the adults, um, please notice I didn't say uh, grown-ups because we have some people who have a little hard time acting like that. So, but if hey, you're an adult, please. I represent please, that remark. You do yes. very much, sweetie. So, uh, so if you are available... And even if you're not, join us anyway. It's always um, a good time, like I said, just for a fellowship. Mm -hmm. And who doesn't like a little bit of dessert and a little bit of snacks? And so and that'll Absolutely. be this Saturday. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Wait a second. Did you come up with the answer to your riddle? Mm hmm. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Cool. So what is your riddle? Ambiance. Oh, ambiance. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so, okay. So see you Saturday. Yep. Well, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record. However, I kind of am. So I'm going to sound like it because it's time for communion. And uh, I, I really, it's really important to me. And it has been important for a long time, except when I was a kid, I got sort of drugged to church, uh, so to speak. And my mom brought all of us kids. And uh, they would have that. So we just called it refreshments. Uh, and so we, time for refreshments. And uh, that didn't go over too well with some of the, well, let's say, older folks in the church. But anyway, that, that's kind of how I thought about it. It was, okay, yeah, it's time for refreshments. So, but over time, especially after I dedicated my life to Christ and he and he's really helped me through a lot of things. It's become a critical time for me. It's that, it's that time, it, it's like your engine just quit. And so you gotta restart it. And we sort of get beat, beat up during the week. Things happen to us, things happen that sort of wear away our our thought of what Jesus did for us way back in the first day that he called us. And it's that first love. It's that first encounter with God, personal encounter with God, 
that was so exciting and so dramatic and it also got my engine going, so to speak. Well, doing that here, when we take communion, that is what it's designed to do. To get your engine started. It's to get you woke up to the reality of what Jesus did for you on that first day. So if you could think back to that first day, I know some of you may be a little more difficult because it happened over a little period of time, but if you can get back and think about how you felt at that moment when, when Christ touched your life and you became totally aware that he was alive and he's in your life and he loves you, that feeling that you had, that's what we want to get back. That's the first love that we have forgotten that got worn away, and so it affects how we live, and pretty soon, if you start living without that, you get carried off into different things. The world, the world takes over. Uh, it, a lot of things take over. So take this time when we pass the, the uh, juice and the uh, cracker, just think about when Christ first touched your life. Try to relive that moment for a second and let the, the, the juice, which represents his blood, and his, the cracker that represents his body, what he did, what he gave to cause you, to enable you to have a relationship with him. Father, we thank you now for this time. We ask your blessing on our hearts and on our minds and on our lives that you will... You will bring alive in us our spirit. Help us to commune with you and talk with you and know that you're our friend and that you're there and you love us and you also are the God of the universe. So I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, at this time we can release the kids and they can go uh, be ministered to by our dedicated staff, Jane, and I'm not sure who's taking care of the younger ones, but kindergarten preschool right over here. First through sixth grade, follow Jane, and you guys can go right now if you'd like. Hey, in case you didn't know, uh, in terms of the offering, you can always, uh, we have a box in the back that's always there, and uh, we uh, have a, a, a thing through Tithely on our website. You can give through Tithely, and of course, you know, bill pay and mail it in, and there's all sorts of other options. Just wanted you to know that. So, okay. All right. So we're in the book of Matthew, and it's also known as the Gospel of Matthew. And today we're looking at a very famous portion of the scripture known as the Sermon on the Mount. And that's probably because Jesus gave this message from the side of a mountain, okay? In Matthew 5, 1, 2, it says, When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. And his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Now, I believe that this little detail has some significance. And uh, in which you have to realize Matthew was writing his gospel to his own Jewish people. So the audience for Matthew was the Jewish people of that day. And your average Jewish person would likely remember that when Moses brought the Old Testament law down to the Jewish people, he brought it from a mountain. It was, you know, he received it on the mountain, he brought it down. And so the Old Covenant, the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments came down from a mountain. And here's Jesus teaching the people from a mountain, and he is bringing a major revision, a new version of the Old Testament law, except this version of the law is much, much higher and much, much harder to obey. I mean, it's extreme. when we get into this, you're going to see it's pretty challenging. No one could ever even keep the Old Testament law. I mean, that was a challenge. If you and I wanted to keep the Old Testament law, we would need a serious spiritual upgrade, okay? But if we're going to obey the law, we're going to look at Jesus brought us, man, we're going to need a whole new, you know, operation system, <laughs> okay? We're going to need a whole new way of looking at it. The problem is... You and I won't seek a new operating system if we don't think we need it. If we think we're good enough, if we think what we're doing is getting us by, you know, we're good the way we are, we're not going to seek or even look at this new thing that Jesus is telling us. So in Jesus' day, the Jewish people took great pride that they possessed the law of God. That was their deal. I mean, they had this law code from God, and many of them, especially religious leaders adopted an attitude of righteous superiority to everybody else. Not all of them, but most of them. And, and anybody who was not, you know, had the law, they were labeled the Gentiles. And it was not a, a, a pleasant or a, a appreciative uh, label, okay? And so as far as they were concerned, they were very special and everybody else were sinners. And uh, thus... The title of this message series, this message series is Matthew's Gospel to the Good, the good people of the world and the not so good, but especially for good people. So Matthew is writing to the people who think they're good. And we got a lot of people in our own culture today. We think we're pretty good people. And uh, therefore, the Gospel of Matthew has something that literary specialists call subtext. Have you heard of subtext? Subtext is... uh, uh, is an underlying and often distinct theme in a piece of writing or conversation. And Matthew has a lot of subtext going on. There's a lot of underlying, distinct meaning in a lot of the things Matthew's writing or has Jesus saying in the gospel. And we see a lot of that in the gospel of Matthew all throughout. But we especially see it in chapter 5. And that's what we're going to look at today. And what, what is happening is Matthew is bringing us Jesus' teaching to help us see that no matter how good we think we are, we're really not that good. You know, we need Jesus. Jesus is setting up, uh, us up to see our need for the gospel, the good news of Jesus. He's trying to help us understand that in the eyes of God, no one is good, and that all of us need the grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus does this by presenting to us a standard of righteousness that no one can possibly keep. 
And when you read about it, you go, you got to be kidding. Yeah, and we're going to see that, okay? So let me show you some places where the subtext shows through. And it really starts at the very beginning in a portion of the scripture known as the Beatitudes. And uh, it's in verse 3. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this kind of, again, rattles us because in our human thinking, we think that the strong in spirit are going to inherit heaven. We think the spiritually wealthy or the spiritually, you know, people who are here spiritually, they're the ones that are going to get in. Jesus says something exactly opposite. Jesus is saying that those of us who realize that we're spiritually impoverished, empty, no resources on our own, powerless. These are the ones that get into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that doesn't make any sense. But that's what Jesus says. This goes against our grain. But he says the poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Why can't the rich in spirit inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's, it's really simple. Because when we're rich in spirit, our egos are too big to get through the door. And it's that simple. That's what we're talking about. In order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we got to get pretty small. We got to realize our true condition. We got to realize our need for God. And that's the very first thing Jesus tries to tell us. And we all struggle with this. All of us have egos that are a little too big to get through the door. So Jesus, in this chapter, tries to humble us a bit. The next place this happens is verse 17. Jesus says, do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so in this verse, Jesus makes very clear that he's not reducing the Old Testament law. Okay? He's not taking away any commands. If anything, he's making it higher. But he says this, I have come to fulfill the law. And uh, that, that's amazing because here's the deal. Many of the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day took great pride in the fact that they kept the letter of the Old Testament law. Because you can keep the letter of the law, but no one could keep the spirit of the law. And when Jesus came, he's saying, I have come to do it. I have come to show you what a person who keeps the whole law of the Old Testament law looks like. And so when you look at me, you're going to understand what the Old Testament law was pointing to. One way to look at the Old Testament law is a connect-the-dot picture. How many of you have ever done a connect-the-dot picture? Okay, so you're connecting the dots. Well, each law in the Old Testament is a dot. And it's possible to connect the dots and not get the picture. But you see, we get the picture. Jesus connected the dots for us. He shows us what the spirit of the law is, not just what the letter of the law is. And he's saying that, hey, if you want to be righteous, you're going to have to be like me. How many of you can say you're as righteous as Jesus? No. Okay? A little humility there. And so we fall short. And then Jesus starts ratcheting us down even more. In verse 20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when the listeners of Jesus' day heard this, they had to be shaking their heads in disbelief because they looked up to the religious leaders. They, they respected them. They venerated them. They, they put them on a pedestal like these guys. Man, they got their life together, you know. And, uh, and so Jesus is basically saying, hey, you want to get in the king, kingdom of heaven? You got to be better than these guys. And so... His listeners are going, man, if I have to be that good, I guess I'm not getting in. There's no hope for me because I'm not that good. And, uh, you know, that's the point. Let me put it in today's terms. If you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be better than Mother Teresa. You've got to be better than Billy Graham. Okay, I think we're in trouble. But it goes on. Jesus wants to, you know, give us a sense of the practicality of this. And this is what he says. He says, uh, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka is answerable to Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Okay. All right. Is there anyone here bold enough to say they've never been angry at someone? 
or ever in your life called someone a name or at least thought it. Yeah, I think we're in trouble, aren't we? You can't get, and, and that's just, his, you know, and so we all struggle with this. And then Jesus, by the way, this is not a three strikes you're out thing. This is not, there's no grading on the curve here. You, you mess up once, you're done. It's kind of scary, but that's how the law works. And then Jesus goes on. He says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Is your mind getting blown a little bit here? Really? Do I even need to ask? Who is that pure? And let me say that while Jesus is being gender specific here, this is an equal gender opportunity sin. Because we all struggle. Everybody struggles. And if this is true with adultery, wouldn't it apply to other things we lust after? I mean, in the Ten Commandments, the last commandment is thou shalt not covet. Can't we covet after other things? Yeah. So obeying this command, you know, is so hard that Jesus suggests that we might need to go to extreme measures. Look at verses 29 and 30. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, that's a little bit over the top, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's kind of man. But this verse is the biggest clue of all of what Jesus is trying to do in this passage. Let me assure you that Jesus is not suggesting that any of us go out and poke our eye out. He's not suggesting that we cut our hand off. He's trying to get us to realize that if you want to be righteous on your own steam, without God, by your own goodness, you're going to have to do some pretty stupid stuff. And even that's not going to work because you can poke your eye out and cut your hand off, and we will still find a way to do wrong. Jesus is pushing us to understand the absurdity of seeing ourselves as good people apart from God. He's trying to help us see our need for something called the gospel or good news of Jesus, because that's what he's driving us to here. And, uh, and that's what he's doing. And then verse 31, 32, Jesus turns to, to the challenge of marriage and staying married. He says, it's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. And of course, you know, one out of two marriages ends in divorce. So, you know, half the people out there going, man, I'm going to hell. Is that really what Jesus means? That marriage is tough. And so tough, we go, man, this, this law is higher. This law is hard. I don't know who can keep this law. It's tough. In fact, when Jesus repeated this command in Matthew 19, his disciples said, if this is the way it is, it's better not to marry. So if you're going to be truly righteous, according to this standard, you better just not get married at all. You're right. (laughs) Okay. You start to see, and Jesus does not expect us to stop getting married. Yeah, he wants us to see that we need help. And he takes it even further. In verses 38 and 42, Jesus says, You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other, or turn to him the other cheek also. I don't know. How many of you do this on a regular basis? You know, this is hard to do once in a while on a good day. But uh, just to make this my lifestyle, I got to hand it to you when... Someone treats me bad on the road, you know, and I'm a preacher. And I'm like, want, you know, I'm wanting to do things that a preacher should not do driving a car. That's why I don't have I love Jesus on my uh, bumper sticker on my car. It's a good move, you know, because I don't want them to know. You know, so that's just reality. <laughs> Loving your enemy is something that does not, oh, we're not past that one. So anyhow, this is tough for us. And, uh, oh, yeah, Jesus goes on. He says, if someone wants to sue you, this is not up there. Take your, if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak. If someone forces you to go one mile, go them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Man, this stuff is all hard. And then in verses uh, 43 through 45, he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, tell you love your enemies. 
and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. Man, how many of you have tried to love your enemy? That's a tough one. And to pray for him even. It's a tough one. This does not come naturally. It's something we cannot do without supernatural empowerment. And so again, Jesus is telling us that if you're going to be righteous, as, as you know, God wants you to be, this is, the, this is the standard. How many of you are up to it? I sh- I'm certainly not. But in the final teaching, the, this is like a nail in the coffin. This is what Jesus says in verse 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You got to be kidding. Is Jesus serious? Now, we often try to get around this teaching by saying what Jesus really means is mature. he wants us to be mature or complete. Because the word can be translated mature or complete. And so he's not saying you have to be perfect. He's just saying you have to be mature. Yeah, the problem is he says you have to be as mature as God. You have to be complete as God. Who can say that? And the truth of the matter is the Greek word literally means perfect. And so, and that's, it, it's, it's intentional. He's saying if you're going to be good on your own steam, on your own power, then you've got to be perfect. Man, who can do that? Who can reach that? And uh, however good you might think you are, I might think I am, we are not that good. How good do you have to be? You know, will good people go to heaven? Absolutely. Who's good? Who's good? Later in Matthew chapter 19, it says, A man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? This young man is already thinking, I can be good on my own. But Jesus responds, why do you ask me about what is good? And he says, there is only one who is good. So Jesus rejects the idea that even, you know, even he's good, although he doesn't deny it. But in uh, Mark's account, Mark, Mark writes, Jesus' response is, no, no one is good except God alone. And so in there, Jesus is telling us, hey, guys, in this world, no one measures up. And Paul echoes this. In the the same idea in Romans chapter 3, he says this, Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. We're all sinners. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There it is. A few verses later, Paul declares, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice he didn't say some. He said all. All of us are included. All of us fall short. And it's it's just what the Bible says. And you see, we've all sinned, and, and uh, the wages of sin is death. And when we have sinned, we're enslaved and sentenced to this thing called death. And, uh, but the Bible says, the gift of God, however, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So what's the gift? Where's the gospel? I mean, he's just hammered us in this chapter. Are we going to get to the gospel in Matthew, I mean, there's any good news in this? Because right now, everybody's like, dang, we're all going to hell. We're, all, we're not going to make it. But there is, throughout Matthew, another subtext, and it's about how Jesus is the gift. Later in Matthew 11, we read this. Jesus says, come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, this gospel hasn't been made that clear yet, but it becomes very clear through the rest of the New Testament. And the subtext of Matthew is designed to help us realize our need for this grace, our need for this, you know, a gift of God. And, and the law, any law, Old Testament, New Testament, is a burden that we cannot bear. We cannot hold it up. And, but Jesus is saying, give me your burden. Give that burden to me and take my yoke upon you. And through Jesus, we receive forgiveness, acceptance. And not only that, he empowers us to be better people. He empowers us to actually make progress toward obeying this higher law. And throughout our Christian lives, we do, in fact, we can forgive our enemies by the grace of God. We can love our enemies. We can stay married and joyfully so. We can... Uh, we, we, can battle, we can win our battle over lust. We can win our battles over anger. We can win battles that before God we never could win. 
because Jesus is bearing the burden with us. And that's the gift. Who among us hasn't struggled with guilt over something you have done in your past or are doing now? Who among us doesn't struggle with a secret shame? Who among us hasn't attached our desire to something and put it before God? I mean, really, who among us hasn't tried to run their their own life without considering God's wishes or will? Who among us, you know, has struggled with distrust? Who among us hasn't gotten angry, you know, with some person or situation that isn't going our way? And I could go on. All of us have fallen. But the good news is this, and Paul states it in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. That's the good news. And Jesus is just trying to make all us good people out there realize our need for it. He died for us. We're not that good, but we can be saved. We can be forgiven. And we can let God begin to work in us to help us to become better people. However, it is a work that's far from finished. And so we can claim progress, but we can never claim perfection. Right? But we can claim that through, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's the good news. And that's what Jesus is trying to get us open to see. Amen? All right, let's all be standing for a closing word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for your love and your grace that comes through Jesus. And I thank you that, uh, that you were wise enough to be a little bit sneaky in helping those of us who live in a culture of good people to see that we're not that good. And you have a way of pushing us so that we realize that we need you. We need your love, your grace. And the neat thing is, Father, once we've experienced your love and your forgiveness, your grace, we are in a position to share it with others. We can share grace with others. We don't have to be judgmental of others. We can be forgiving of others. We can be free from all the stuff that used to enslave us before because of the gift of grace through your son Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.